Let me invite us to turn to the passage that we will be considering this evening, Colossians chapter 4. And we will look at verse 2 to verse 4. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 to 4. And I read, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Let's ask the Lord one more time for his help. O oh Lord, we come before you this evening. We ask you, O oh Lord, that you may teach us, help us to be humble, help us to be ready and willing to not just hear your word, but to apply it in our lives by the power of your Holy Spirit. Help me, O oh Lord, to speak as I ought to, in simplicity, in clarity, O oh Lord. Reveal yourself to us, O oh Lord, through your word this afternoon, for we pray and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Life has two sides to it, if I can say it, where we have one side that we maintain life, and the other side is to progress in life. You simply don't live so that you may see the next day. You live and you take care of yourself so that you may progress in life. This also happens, for example, we, we see this principle working out even in places like in the military, where when you go to war, you have two clear assignments. Ensure that you are safe or you are alive as you go to the battlefield, field, but also ensure that you progress that you not only keep yourself safe, you not only hide yourself in the, uh, the, the trenches, but whenever possible, progress in the war effort. And Paul, in the, to the, towards the end of his letter to the Colossians, he gives them these instructions in the following verses. He tells them and he shows them that they need to stay true to the gospel that they've just been uh, reacquainted with, but to also pray and to strive for the progress of the same gospel that they have just been reestablished in. Remember, this was a church that was under much trouble. The church had been infiltrated by false teachers, and these false teachers were bringing to them another way of sanctification and salvation apart from Christ. And after Paul reaffirms them and reestablishes them in the true gospel, he comes to them and he tells them, rather he commands them, brethren, pray. And this evening I would like us to look at the same command that was not only given to the Colossians, but is given to us, and how it applies to you and me who are part of the body of Christ. So this evening, I would like us to look at the preserving and the progressing power of prayer. Paul points to prayer as the one tool that would do both. Prayer is like a double-edged sword. 
Prayer serves the purpose of keeping us true and firm in the gospel, but it also serves to progress or to advance the work of the gospel. And so this, uh, as we look at this topic, I would like us to look at some of the ways that he presents this truth. And firstly, I would like us to see that Paul commands the believers to pray for perseverance in the gospel. He commands them to pray for perseverance in the gospel. And we see this in verse 2. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Like I told you during my introduction, the church in Colossae was under constant or heavy temptation to turn away from Christ and to follow carnal things. And now, since they had been reestablished in the true gospel, they are commanded to remain true, to continue, to remain steadfast in the gospel by being steadfast in prayer. Prayer is therefore, dear brethren, the preserving agent in the Christian life. Prayer is a preserving quality or discipline in our Christian walk. And the phrase used here by Paul is a, a phrase he chose combat, struggle, almost speaks of warfare, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. What he is commanding the believers is that they must continue firmly in prayer. And actually the word continue there is the word persevere. So he's telling them, persevere struggle, push through. You can imagine a soldier who is tired, but they have gotten an opportunity to overcome the enemy. And their commanding officer is telling them, let's move forward. We already have them. Persevere, continue on, push on. This is what Paul is telling the church in Colossae. And the same message, the same truth, is coming to us this evening. The believer must persevere in the narrow way of the gospel by persevering in prayer. Do you want to persevere in the gospel? Do you want to persevere in your Christian walk? And remember, the Christian walk, Christ described it as a narrow way. And you don't walk through a narrow way comfortably. You squeeze yourself. You push yourself. You strain yourself. And how do you do this? It is by you persevering in prayer. Just as a good soldier never venture. Uh, in the same way that a good soldier never ventures far from the supply line, so the Christian, in his spiritual fight, must be near the constant supply of the throne of God. They must not keep far away from the throne of God. The believer is to be ready both for the judge and for the tempter by praying. And this is what Christ said to his disciples. Watch therefore for you know neither the day nor the hour. You do not know when your Lord will return and you do not know the next time your tempter will be on your back. So what should you do? Pray. 
The apostle again uses another phrase, and it's also a military or a combat phrase. Be watchful in it. So prayer is not something that you do out of comfort. Prayer is a warfare item. It's a warfare tool. Just like a soldier will carry his gun no matter how heavy it is. They will continue to persevere in it. And so the believers in Colossae and we too are being urged to be watchful in prayer. And this directs, uh, speaks about the, uh, the posture of prayer. To be watchful is a call to alertness of mind and guarding against the weariness of the body during prayer. You will all agree with me that it is during prayer time that we find our bodies being tired. It is during prayers that we find our mind wandering away. I don't know whether that happens to you. Happens a lot with me. Keeping a lot in prayer is not just a good discipline. It is a commanded discipline. We must be watchful in prayer. It is important that we make uh, it is important that we make every effort to ensure that our humanly weaknesses and our physical needs do not blunt our prayer time. We must ensure dear brethren in being watchful what we are being commanded to is even though you are weak in the body and even though you have your human needs. Make sure that during prayer time, you subdue them to the extent that you are now alert. Your mind is focused. For oftentimes, we go for prayer meetings or you are praying, and then as you are praying, you just realize that words are coming out, but your mind is not engaged in those words. The command here then is to deal with your thoughts and to bring them to focus. Be alert. Be watchful. And this is what Christ was saying to the disciples. This is what he told them at the time of great temptation. Watch and pray that you do not enter into temptation. For the spirit indeed is willing, but what is the problem? But the flesh is weak. Our flesh, the weakness of our flesh, dear brothers and sisters, and the needs of our bodies. Just when you are about to pray, then you realize that you are hungry and you need something to bite. Don't let that distract you from prayer. This is what the brethren are being commanded to. In persevering in prayer, you must bring your human needs to subjection so that they do not distract you from this very important work of prayer. But this perseverance and alertness must be mixed with a very important ingredient, and that is thanksgiving, to be thankful, to be grateful. And this morning we were reminded of that again. That being grateful, being thankful, is such an important element of prayer that it appears in many prayers in the Bible. It is one of the things we are encouraged to do whenever we pray. For even as we pray, and we look forward to receiving, and we hope to receiving, as we, we, as we consider the prayers that have been deferred, as we consider the prayers that have been denied, dear brethren, 
we must be thankful. We must give thanks to the Lord. We must be grateful for the basics. You are reminded this morning that we need to be thankful for the fact that we are in a kingdom that cannot be shaken. A kingdom that is lasting. The other kingdoms will pass away. Human kingdoms rise and fall. Our kingdom will last. Be thankful for that. We must be thankful that we can come to the throne of grace through Christ. That we can approach the throne of grace with much confidence. Remember that our God is a consuming fire. But yet, he has allowed sinners like you and me to approach his throne. And this is what Paul was telling the Colossians. Persevere in prayer. Struggle in prayer. Remain true to prayer. But do this. Being alert and do this with much thanksgiving in your heart. But then secondly, as we see in verse 3, he not only tells them to pray, or rather to uh, pray for perseverance in the gospel, that they remain true in the gospel, but he asks them to pray for something. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. So secondly, Paul asks them to pray for opportunities to spread the gospel. So brother, sister, it's not enough that you have remained true to the gospel. It's not enough for you to pray that you may be your, your, your roots may grow deeper in the gospel. You must, I must pray for the progress of the gospel. That this message of Christ would spread throughout the world. Even as the Colossians are commanded to pray for themselves, the apostle implores them to pray for open doors for what he calls the mystery of Christ. The gospel here is referred to as a mystery, not because it is unintelligible, but because it is hidden from many. The eyes of many are closed by the God of this world. And therefore, we need to pray for the gospel. There is need, therefore, that prayer be made for geographical places to be reached by the gospel and for the blind eyes to be opened to the saving knowledge of Christ. So we are not only praying that the gospel will spread geographically, but we are saying may it spread in terms of the individuals being won over by the gospel. The implication that Paul makes here in this request is that the opportunity, uh, the, the, the work of opening eyes to the gospel and, to, uh, and its expansion to new lands are in the hands of God and not ours. We desire and we plan to use means to spread the gospel, but it is for God to grant us success. So Paul, first of all, is calling each of us to humility. Even Paul himself is acknowledging that without your prayers, without God opening doors, there is nothing that he, the great apostle, can do. And if, and if the Apostle Paul is this humble, to the extent that he says, I need your prayers, 
Please plead to God on my behalf for doors to be open. How much more you and I? Brethren, true prayer for the lost begins with us being humble. With us acknowledging that we cannot do anything for the lost by our own power. We cannot do anything for those who are lost in this city. We cannot do anything for those who are lost in the Middle Eastern countries. We, by our own strength, can do nothing. We may have conferences and thank God for conferences. We may write books and thank God for books. We may do all that is humanly possible to do. But if God himself does not open doors, then our plans, our ambitions will float, fall flat on their face. So we must be humble first of all. Doors are opened by God. Doors are not opened by our intellectual ability to argue the gospel. It's great that you know how to argue the gospel. But it is God that opens eyes to the gospel. Open doors of nations. Open doors of universities. Open doors of schools. But it is also secondly a call for those who are in Christ to pray for missionary activ activity. Whether the desire for outreach or for ongoing efforts to spread the gospel. So, it doesn't end with you being humble and acknowledging, I can't do anything. Because some people are there, they just say, well, we can't do anything. Um, the Lord can, will do whatever he wants to do. No, it doesn't end there. We know we can't open doors, but we prepare ourselves, and we pray then, for missionary activity. We must pray for our desires of outreach. Do we have desires as a church? We have outlined them in our prayer diary that we endeavor to send every month. Do you look at those, some of those activities that we desire? They may not be ongoing, but it's something that is in our heart as leaders in this church. Do you pray with us? Or do you just say, well, that's a desire. Let me give priority to the ongoing work. Yes, pray for the ongoing work, but also pray for the desire, because this was a desire of Paul. When someone asks you, you know, I have this desire to reach this group of people or that geographical area. We must respond with prayer. We must pray for opportunities to be open for the gospel. And on top of that, we must also pray for great courage when such opportunities open up. So when Paul is saying, pray for me, that doors may be opened, he's praying, Lord, may the Lord open doors, but may I be ready. May we as the workers be ready. Because the reality is, the fields are ripe. They are ready. The workers are few. Some of the opportunities, the reason why we need to pray for courage and for boldness, even as we pray for open doors, is because some, or even, may I even say, most of the gospel opportunities arise in moments of trials and persecutions. And Christ himself stated this in Matthew 13 verse 9. When he told, told his disciples, But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for, uh, kings for my sake, 
to bear witness for me. Let's pray for courage, dear brethren. And that's why on the last part of that statement uh, in verse 13, he says, on account of which I am in prison. I am a prisoner. I am locked up. My life can be taken any time. Why would a prisoner pray for open doors when he is locked in a jail cell? He's praying for boldness. He's praying for courage to present the gospel for the guards who come to watch over him. That he would not fear them, but rather that he would speak the gospel to these men. It is a prayer that we must pray that, or rather we should pray that all resistance to the gospel be removed and that the preacher or the preachers of the gospel would have liberty of bringing forth the truths about Christ. The brethren in Acts chapter 4 verse 29 prayed this way, And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. Do we pray that for our pastors? Do we pray that for those who preach in our pulpit every Sunday? That, oh Lord, please give our pastors courage. Give them boldness. For indeed, brother, the, brothers, there is a lot that can intimidate a preacher. There is a lot that can bring fear in the heart of a preacher. Pray for boldness. And we see this prayer being answered in one way in, in, in Acts, at the very end of the book of Acts, in Acts 28 and verse 31, we see Paul doing what? Proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Now that's what we are praying for. And that's what we should pray for whenever we pray for the gospel work. So we pray for ourselves that we may remain true to the gospel. That we may not turn away from the truths that were once and for all delivered to us. But we must also pray for this same gospel to move forward without hindrance that the Lord would send out men who are courageous, who are bold, that the gospel work would not be hindered in any way. And especially, I think this is very important for us at this time. Because the truth is, the church is being intimidated in one way or another. You see the headlines in newspapers. The church is the weak link. You see church leaders being criticized left, right, and center. Let's pray for the progress of the gospel, especially at this time. Let's pray that the preachers of the true gospel will be bold, that they would not shy, they would not be timid at this time. But then thirdly, and finally, we see in verse 4, another principle that he gives them, where he asks the church to pray not just for the opportunities or rather for opportunities of the gospel to be open, but to pray for the effective presentation of the gospel. It's not enough that the gospel is spoken, but it is done effectively. 
And this is what he requests in verse 4. That I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. While the request in the first part of verse uh, in verse 3 rather, rather is for the Lord to open a door or doors for the gospel. The second part of Paul's request is to pray or rather prayer for his duty or for the duty of individual ministers or individual preachers. Now note that he doesn't ask that he may preach but that he may preach as he ought to. Or as, the, or as the Lord would have him preach. We don't just preach, we preach as we ought to. As the Lord desires or as he requires or as he demands for us, from us. We don't have the luxury to preach the gospel, to present the gospel however we want. We must do it in the way that Christ himself has outlined in the scriptures. Remember again that the gospel of Christ is called a mystery. And as John Gill describes the word mystery there, he says that... Uh, it was hid in God from everlasting and during the legal dispensation was wrapped in types. So the gospel was there, but it was wrapped in types and shadows and sacrifices and is still hidden to the natural man. So the gospel is this treasure that is hidden or that is wrapped up in a number of things. And it is there for the work of faithful preachers to unwrap the truths of Christ and to apply them to the hearts of the hearers by the power of the Holy Spirit. So a preacher is like a person opening up a gift. Or opening up a parcel. They open it up so that they, what is true, what is the important thing in there can be seen. Can be made visible. If you look at natural, uh, the, the, the natural uh, appearance of diamond, for example... Diamond is, in nature, is not the way it looks like in the jewelry shop. Natural diamond is, almost looks like a rock. Dirty. Has a number of impurities. It is not shaped rightly or as uh, in, in a way that it can be used by jewelers. And what is the work of the jeweler? To ensure that he or she cuts the diamond in such a way that it will be beautiful. Removes the corners, the edges, such that the beautiful diamond can be seen. Now that's the work of the preacher and he's Asking the church in Colossae, pray for me. Pray for the preachers of the gospel. And the same request goes out to you as a member of Trinity Baptist Church, as a member of your church, wherever you're watching us from, to pray for your pastors, to pray for those who work hard to bring the gospel to you, that they may do it in the right way. Gospel ministry is not simply a presentation of Bible truths. So to be a Bible preacher, with all due respect, is not the same way as being a CRE teacher. 
We are not just presenting truths about the Bible. Preachers of the Bible are authoritative in their presentation of the truths found in the scriptures and yet they are clear and simple. This is what Paul asks for. That I may make it clear. That is his request. Pray for me, O church, that I would make the mystery of Christ clear. That I would make the mystery of Christ simple. He is praying for simplicity. The gospel work is not to make things harder. It is to make things easier in terms of people understanding the truth of the Bible. This is why pastors labor within the week to study and they labor hard on Sunday to present the gospel because this is a heavy work. Taking the truth of Christ, can you imagine truths that have been hidden from eternity, that were hidden or that were wrapped in types and symbols and shadows and sacrifices. And on top of that are hidden because of sin. Can you imagine now unwrapping that truth? Opening up that truth? It's a lot of work. To make the gospel to be simple, to make it clear, is heavy work, my dear brethren. And to us as preachers, this is what we are being called to. Our work is to make the gospel clear because this is what Christ requires of us. This is what Christ requires of me as a preacher. I must seek to remove all hindrances to the gospel. My work shouldn't be to show you how much Greek I know or how much Hebrew I know. It's good for you to know Greek and Hebrew, but it's more important for you to know Christ and him crucified. And this is why sometimes I, I, I believe that if you want to grow in making the gospel simple, if you want to grow in the work of uh, preaching the gospel, teach the gospel to children. And you will learn how to make the gospel clear. That should encourage you to be a Sunday school teacher. Endeavor, if you are a parent at home, endeavor to bring the gospel, make it simple and clear to the children. Endeavor to make the gospel clear and simple to those who do not know English or Greek or Hebrew. This is the work of a true preacher. Not again to add on top of the, 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 the wrappings, to add more wrapping on top of it. And it's also a call for us to pray with our pastors. Not for us to just say, well, I really don't understand that preacher. He's so difficult. Have you prayed for him? Paul is asking, pray for me. Paul, the great apostle, acknowledges that this is an area of his ministry that he needs growth and prayer. Paul himself is saying, please pray for me that I may make the gospel clear. If Paul was struggling, how much more your pastors? We are being called, therefore, O church, to stand with our pastors and those who labor in our midst to preach the gospel. As they prepare, we pray. As they preach, we pray. 
Paul then also says in Romans 15, I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive with me in prayers to God on my behalf. Strive together with me. He's not just saying, do it at your own luxury. Do it casually. Strive. Struggle. Persevere with me in prayer. To God. That I may preach the gospel. That my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. Dear brethren, there is much that we need to strive for. And we must strive in prayer. We must pray that we may persevere in the gospel. One of the ways that you can tell that you are in spiritual danger is when your prayer life declines. The truth is there is a lot of there is a lot of Christian discipline that can be taken away from you. For example, fellowship, we are not able to fellowship together or gather together here in Donholm. Even reading the scriptures can be taken away from us. You can lose your sight or you can lose your sight and at the same time be taken to a place where you don't have the Bible. All other Christian disciplines can be taken from you, but never prayer. Even when you are sick on your deathbed, even when you lose your speech, you can still pray in your heart. Do you see what a beautiful, what a wonderful, what a useful tool we have in prayer? Brethren, we must persevere in this. If you want to persevere in the gospel, if you want to remain true in the gospel, pray for yourself. Just as Paul told the church in Colossae, pray for yourselves. You are in constant danger of the tempter. Pray for yourselves. Because if you cease to pray, the tempter is outside your door, roaring like a lion, ready to devour you. Pray for opportunities for the gospel. Don't be selfish with the salvation that God has granted you. Pray that this word would go to other nations. Pray that this live stream service that is being broadcast on Facebook and on YouTube, that somehow, through God's providence, that someone in Saudi Arabia would click on this and that they would hear the gospel. Pray that someone on Facebook who was just scrolling through his phone would come upon this someone or other someone and that they would hear the gospel being preached. Pray for open doors for us as a church. Pray also that we, as ministers of the gospel, may handle the word of God with much care. And that above all, we may seek to be simple and clear as we present the truths of the word of God. Now, to the unbeliever who may be listening to this, the sad fact from this sermon is that because you are living in sin. Because you have rejected God, you cannot approach his throne of grace. To you, the throne of grace is a throne of judgment. It is your judgment seat. It is a seat of your judge who will declare you guilty. For all humanity is under sin. You cannot save yourself through good works. You cannot save yourself by one action uh, of uh, 
charity or another at this time, no matter how much you help the poor at this time, that will not save you. The only way of salvation, the only way to escape the judgment of God is to run to this your judge, to plead to him, to pray and ask him to save you, even right now. And the Lord Jesus Christ has promised that those who repent of their sins and believe in him, that he is faithful and just and he will save them. So pray this afternoon and ask him to save you. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we come before you we thank you that we can approach your throne at any time with much confidence because you are our Father in Christ. And, O oh Lord, we pray for ourselves that you would help us to remain true to the gospel. Have mercy upon us, O oh Lord, for we are those who are tempted to wander from our Savior. We are tempted to wander from the source of our strength. Oh Lord, forgive us and help us to persevere in prayer, to watch and pray. Help us to keep alert, to guard our minds. Help us to overcome the weaknesses of our bodies, the, our physical needs which oftentimes blunt our time of prayer. O oh Lord, help us to deny ourselves even those good things for the sake of prayer. And O oh Lord, help us that we may not just pray, bringing to you requests, but we may also be thankful for what you have given to us. That even as we look at those things that you have deferred and those things that you have denied us, that we would rejoice that we are children of the Most High God. That our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. O oh Lord, we also pray that the work of the gospel may continue to progress. O oh Lord, we pray that opportunities for the gospel may open up. And we ask you, Lord, that you would give preachers boldness and courage to bring forth the gospel. Help us, Lord, not to be timid at this time, not to be shy. When the world is dying, when thousands are dying and they are meeting their judge, Oh, Lord, help us not to look away, but with courage to rise up and preach the gospel. We even pray, Lord, that the live stream services, the YouTube messages that are there, that, oh, Lord, this would even be used for the extension of your kingdom. Oh, Lord, open up doors. We ask you and we plead with you, oh, Lord, open doors for the gospel. And be pleased, O oh Lord, to use us. We pray that for us who are the preachers of the gospel, that we would be effective in our work. That we would be careful to present the truths of Christ in such a simple, clear way. Such that even the little children can understand it, O oh Lord. Help us, Lord, to labor together with those who are preparing sermons within the week. May we join our hands together with our pastors in prayer. May we strive with them as they pray and as they prepare. May we strive with them as they preach, O oh Lord. Light up the fire, the, the fire of prayer in our hearts. Cause us to always be on our knees, to be watchful, to be alert, lest our tempter overtakes us, O oh Lord. 
So be with us, O Lord, for we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.